2. Dossier for M. Two weeks before, this memorandum had gone from Station S of the Secret Service to M, who was then and is today head of this adjunct to the British Defense Ministries. To M. From Head of S. Subject. A project for the destruction of Monsieur Le Chiffre, alias the number, Herr Nummer, Herr Ziffer, etc., one of the opposition's chief agents in France and undercover paymaster of the Syndicat des Ouvriers d'Alsace, the communist-controlled trade union in the heavy and transport industries of Alsace, and as we know, an important fifth column in the event of war with Redland. Documentation. Head of Archives Biography of Le Chiffre is attached at Appendix A. Also, Appendix B. A note on Smirsch. We have been feeling for some time that Le Chiffre is getting into deep water. In nearly all respects, he is an admirable agent of the USSR, but his gross physical habits and predilections are an Achilles heel of which we have been able to take advantage from time to time, and one of his mistresses is a Eurasian, number 1860, controlled by Station F, who has recently been able to obtain insight into his private affairs. Briefly, it seems Le Chiffre is on the brink of a financial crisis. Certain straws in the wind were noticed by 1860, some discreet sales of jewelry, the disposal of Villa and Antibes, and a general tendency to check the loose spending which has always been a feature of his way of life. Further inquiries were made with the help of our friends at the Dizième Bureau, with whom we have been working jointly on this case, and a curious story has come to light. In January 1946, Le Chiffre, by control of a chain of brothels, known as the Cordon Jaune, operating in Normandy and Brittany, he was foolish enough to employ for this purpose some 50 million francs of monies entrusted to him by Leningrad Section 3 for the funding of Soda, the trade union mentioned above. Normally, the Cordon Jaune would have proved a most excellent investment, and it is possible that Le Chiffre was motivated more by a desire to increase his union funds than by the hopes of lining his own pockets by speculating with his employer's money. However that may be, it is clear that he could have found many investments more savory than prostitution if he had not been tempted by the byproduct of unlimited women for his personal use. Fate rebuked him with terrifying swiftness. Barely three months later, on 13 April, there was passed in France law number 46685, entitled Loi tendant à la fermeture des maisons de tolérance et au renforcement de la lutte contre le proxénétisme. When M came to this sentence, he grunted and pressed a switch on the intercom. Head of S? Sir! What the hell does this word mean? He spelt it out. Pimping, sir! This is not the Berlitz School of Languages, Head of S. If you want to show off your knowledge of foreign jawbreakers, be good enough to provide a crib. Better still, write in English! Sorry, sir! M released the switch and turned back to the memorandum. This law, he read, known popularly as Le Loi Mère Richard, closing all houses of ill fame and forbidding the sale of pornographic books and films, knocked the bottom out of his investment almost overnight, and suddenly Le Chiffre was faced with a serious deficit in his union funds. In desperation, he turned his open houses into maisons de passe, with clandestine rendezvous could be arranged on the borderline of the law, and he continued to operate one or two cinéma bleu underground. But these shifts served in no way to cover his overheads, and all attempts to sell his investment, even at a heavy loss, failed dismally. Meanwhile, the police de Mieux were on his trail, and in a short while, twenty or more of his establishments were closed down. The police were, of course, only interested in this man as a big-time brothel keeper, and it was not until we expressed an interest in his finances that the Deuxième Bureau unearthed the parallel dossier which was running with their colleagues at the police department. The significance of the situation became apparent to us and to our French friends, and in the past few months, a veritable rat hunt has been operated by the police after the establishment of the Cordon Jaune, with the result that today nothing remains of the chief's original investment, and any routine inquiry would reveal a deficit of around 50 million francs in the trade union funds of which he is treasurer and paymaster. It does not seem that the suspicions of Leningrad have been aroused yet, but, unfortunately for Le Chiffre, it is possible that at any rate Smirsch is on the scent. Last week, a high-grade source of Station P reported that a senior official of this efficient organ of Soviet vengeance had left Warsaw for Strasbourg via the eastern sector of Berlin. There is no confirmation of this report from the Deuxième Bureau, nor from the authorities in Strasbourg, who are reliable and thorough, and there is also no news from Le Chiffre's headquarters there, which we have well covered by a double agent, in addition to 1860. If Le Chiffre knew that Smirsch was on his tail, or that they had the smallest suspicion of him, he would have no alternative but to commit suicide or attempt to escape. But his present plan suggests that while he is certainly desperate, he has not yet realized that his life may be at stake. It is these rather spectacular plans of his that have suggested to us a counter-operation, which, though risky and unconventional, we submit at the end of this memorandum with confidence. In brief, the shift plans, we believe, to follow the example of most other till robbers and make good the deficit in his accounts by gambling. The bourse is too slow. So are the various illicit traffics in drugs or rare medicines, such as oro and streptomycin and cortisone. No racetracks could carry the sort of stakes he will have to play, and, if he wins, he would more likely be killed than paid off. In any case, we know that he has withdrawn the final 25 million francs from the treasury of his union, and that he has taken a small villa in the neighborhood of Royal les Eaux, just north of Dieppe, for a week from a fortnight tomorrow. Now, it is expected that the casino at Royal will see the highest gambling in Europe this summer, in an effort to wrest the big money from Deauville and the Tourquette, the Société des Bains de Mer de Royal have leased the Baccarat and the top two chemin de fer tables to the Mohammed Ali Syndicate, a group of emigre Egyptian bankers and businessmen with, it is said, a call on certain royal funds who have for years been trying to cut in on the profits of Zagrafos and his Greek associates, resulting from their monopoly of the highest French Baccarat banks. With the help of discreet publicity, a considerable number of the biggest operators in America and Europe have been encouraged to book at Royale this summer, and it seems possible that this old-fashioned watering place will regain some of its Victorian renown. Be that as it may, it is here that Le Chiffre will, we are confident, endeavor on or after 15 June to make a profit at background of 50 million francs on a working capital of 25 million, and, incidentally, save his life. Proposed Counter-Operation 
It would be greatly in the interest of this country and of the other nations of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization that this powerful Soviet agent should be ridiculed and destroyed, that his communist trade union should be bankrupted and brought into disrepute, and that this potential fifth column with the strength of 50,000 capable in time of war of controlling a wide sector of France's northern border should lose faith and cohesion. This would result if the chief could be defeated at the tables. NB. Assassination is pointless. Leningrad would quickly cover up his defalcations and make him into a martyr. We therefore recommend that the finest gambler available to the service should be given the necessary funds and endeavor to outgamble this man. The risks are obvious, and the potential loss to the secret funds is high, but other operations on which large sums have been hazarded have had fewer chances of success, often for a smaller objective. If the decision is unfavorable, the only alternative would be to place our information and recommendations into the hands of the Dizian Bureau or of our American colleagues in the Central Intelligence Agency in Washington. Both of these organizations would doubtless be delighted to take over the scheme. Signed, S. Appendix A. Name, Le Chiffre. Aliases. Variations on the words cipher or number in different languages, e.g. Herr Ziffer. Origin, unknown. First encountered as a displaced person, inmate of Dachau DP camp in the U.S. zone of Germany, June 1945. Apparently suffering from amnesia and paralysis of vocal cords. Both feigned? Dumbness succumbed to therapy, but subject continued to claim total loss of memory, except associations with Alsace-Lorraine and Strasbourg, whether he was transferred in September 1945 on stateless passport number 304596. Adopted the name Le Chiffre, since I am only a number on a passport. No Christian names. Age, about 45. Description. Height, 5 feet 8 inches. Weight, 18 stones. Complexion, very pale. Clean shaven. Head, red brown embrasse. Eyes, very dark brown with whites showing all around iris. Small, rather feminine mouth. False teeth of expensive quality. Ears small with large lobes, indicating some Jewish blood. Hands small, well-tended hirsute. Feet small. Racially subject is probably a mixture of Mediterranean with Prussian or Polish strains. Dresses well and meticulously, generally in dark double-breasted suits. Smokes incessantly carporals with a decontinizing holder. At frequent intervals, inhales from a benzedrine inhaler. Voice soft and even. Bilingual in French and English. Good German. Traces of a Marseille accent. Smiles infrequently. Does not laugh. Habits. Mostly expensive, but discreet. Large sexual appetites. Flagellant. Expert driver of fast cars. Adept with small arms and other forms of personal combat, including knives. Carries three ever-sharp razor blades in hat band, heel of left shoe, and cigarette case. Knowledge of accountancy and mathematics. Fine gambler. Always accompanied by two armed guards. Well-dressed, one French, one German. Details available. Comment. A formidable and dangerous agent of the USSR, controlled by Leningrad Station 3 through Paris. Signed, Archivist. Appendix B. Subject, Smirsch. Sources, own archives and scanty material made available by Dizian Bureau and CIA Washington. Smirsch is a conjunction of two Russian words. Smirch Bionam, meaning roughly, death to spies. Ranks above MWD, formerly NKVD, and is believed to come under the personal direction of Beria. Headquarters, Leningrad, substation at Moscow. Its task is the elimination of all forms of treachery and backsliding with the various branches of the Soviet Secret Service and Secret Police at home and abroad. It is the most powerful and feared organization in the USSR and is popularly believed never to have failed in a mission of vengeance. It is thought that Smirsch was responsible for the assassination of Trotsky in Mexico, 22 August 1940, and may have indeed made its name with this successful murder after attempts by other Russian individuals and organizations had failed. Smirsch was next heard of when Hitler attacked Russia. It was then rapidly expanded to cope with treachery and double agents during the retreat of Soviet forces in 1941. At that time, it worked as an executive squad for the NKVD, and its present selective mission was not so clearly defined. The organization itself was thoroughly purged after the war and is now believed to consist of only a few hundred operatives of very high quality divided into five sectors. Department 1. In charge of counterintelligence among Soviet organizations at home and abroad. Department 2. Operations, including executions. Department 3. Administration and finance. Department 4. Investigations and legal work. Personnel. Department 5. Prosecution. The section which passes final judgment on all victims. Only one Smirsch operative has come to our hands since the war. Goichev, alias Gerard Jones. He shot Pechora, medical officer at the Yugoslav Embassy in Hyde Park, 7 August 1948. During an interrogation, he committed suicide by swallowing a coat button of compressed potassium cyanide. He revealed nothing beyond his membership of Smirsch, of which he was arrogantly boastful. We believe that the following British double agents were victims of Smirsch. Donovan, Harthrop Vane, Elizabeth Dumont, Ventor, Mace, Saverin. For details, see Morgue, Section Q. Conclusion. Every effort should be made to improve our knowledge of this very powerful organization and destroy its operatives.